with spatial or spatial temporal statistics. And uh, kind of the um, title from the program is uh, still only on a kind of shaped for half a day, but kind of we uh, moved on to a full day. So that's why the cop class squeeze in here uh, that hasn't been on the announcement that I didn't update, I'm sorry. Um, we have, the question is, what happens if the world is not non-Gaussian? So kind of all the projects we have seen now before is on, always on the assumption that we can assume a Gaussian random field, a Gaussian process that kind of is able to capture our process. But uh, the problem is this isn't always the case. It's sometimes the best thing we can do, but kind of what are there for kind of options if we want to go beyond the Gaussian distribution? So it's not normal distributed. Um, there's a nice mathematical concept called copulas, and these copulas uh, allow to model dependence much more flexible than uh, you would do with the covariance matrix. And these copulas are used to build multivariate distributions. And uh, as just said in the earlier session, that the Quijing prediction is only using a Gaussian distribution as a huge distribution in the background to predict values based on this distribution. Um, copulas can as well help you to build multivariate distributions for spatial fields, but kind of they originate uh, originally from financial mathematics, where they started to use copulas to describe uh, some uh, indices, brokerage indices, and their dependencies on each other. So for the moment, just take copulas as a concept to describe dependence and uh, kind of what the effect is, is shown in this first figure here. Um, just to say there is as well a Gaussian copula, and the Gaussian copula is exactly what we would do if we use a Gaussian distribution. So it's not an either or, it's kind of an extension of the Gaussian uh, approach to different dependent structures. So the middle column of this plot are all Gaussian dependent structures. <coughs> well, on, the le <coughs> sorry. on the left hand column is a Gumbel dependent structure, on the right hand column the Clayton dependent structure. And kind of row wise, the top row is, um, so we're looking at, at, at snapshots of a random field here. So kind of this wireframe, this kind of elevation model is supposed to be some process that we look at and kind of the single cell of these random fields, that's one that we kind of set for a certain value. So we could assume we observe a value of 180 and 5, and then we would like to know how does a random field look around. So just the same question as we have been answering with uh, creaking interpolation techniques. How does a random field behave if we have observed values, and how does it look around these values that, that we observed in the kind of spreading in the field? So if you use a Gumbel uh, dependence type structure and we have kind of a very high value observed here, then the Gumbel dependence structure assumes, okay, everything else is high as well. So we kind of have a high value, but we have kind of uh, an, an even and flat surface. This is different for the Clayton type. When we have a high value observed, the Clayton copy is, well, it's high, but it could be much higher, it could be a bit lower. So there's a huge variability still in the field. And the Gaussian copy is somewhere in between. And if we kind of move over to the small values, here 95, just as a sample example data point, uh, it's just the other way around. So the Gumbel copula allows a very strong variability for low values. So if it's low, it could still be much higher or even lower. Uh, and the Clayton copula would assume if it is low, then everything else around us is also a low value. So that's kind of the effect of different uh, dependent structures you could look at. The Gaussian distribution in the middle column kind of is always a bit in between, and kind of what is the property of the Gaussian dependent structure is that it's symmetric in the sense that it has the same variability for the high value at 185 here as for the low value at 95. So it doesn't distinguish between high and low values, the variability is always the same. And that's something that you kind of might find uh, in, spa in, in actual real spatial random fields as well that you would like to model and to describe um, later on in your process. And besides in the spatial application, it kind of it has many applications 
In uh, hydrology, for instance, uh, hydrologists use copulas to describe multivariate return periods. So if you look at the dam design at a certain level, and you would like to uh, look at peak flow duration and um, peak discharge of certain rainstorms, then you kind of can model those three variables based on copulas much more efficiently and flexibly than you could do if you were to do like a regression analysis of it. And you can get to very different results in terms of uh, return period, in terms of the size of the uh, kind of uh, annual maxima, 100-year maxia, maxima. So kind of how does this work? Let's start on a simple case where we have only two dimensions. So we look into bivariate copulas. Um, so on the left-hand side, this scatter plot is just kind of a typical scatter plot you might uh, come across during your studies, and uh, what you see in the histograms is just the distribution of the marginal. So we have variable x and a variable y, and y has a certain distribution, and x has a certain distribution. In this case, the marginal distributions are both standard normal distributed. So this kind of the marginals are just Gaussian standard normal distributions, but kind of the joint distribution of it seems to have a pretty strong correlation. So in the Gaussian case, you would just kind of estimate the correlation parameter, put it as a into the covariance matrix of your Gaussian distribution, and you would have kind of two-dimensional distribution of this process. In theory of copula cells, you, uh, you can take the margins away from it. That's what we did here. So uh, if you have the marginal distribution, you can take the cumulative distribution function, and you get to uniform distributed uh, variables. That's what we kind of get in this picture. So the marginal distributions are kind of as kind of uniform distribution of the unit interval. And this happens for both cases. And what you see here as a scatter plot then is kind of the actual dependent structure. That's kind of the copula that we talk of. The copula describes how these points are spread in this um, area. And kind of, it, um, if you look at the Gaussian copula, then it's simply the Correlation is a parameter of a copula, and kind of the spread, how you would see the spread in this figure is simply defined by the family. So the family, if it's Gumbel, if it's Clayton, if it's Gaussian, you might get all kind of different spreads here, and kind of all kind of funny values as well that you wouldn't have been able to model with kind of standard techniques. Um, this is just kind of two different scatter plots of kind of real data you might find. Um, it's simply the exponential distribution in those two cases, and here it's a mixture of exponential and standard normal distribution. And what's so special about all these plots, they all have the exact same dependent structure. So these two plots and this left plot all have the same copula underlying, that's this lower right corner plot. So by this kind of concept of copulas, by removing the marginal distributions and kind of the um, distortion of the margins on the dependent structure, you kind of can reveal the depending structure and kind of, even though the plots look very, very different, they really have the same structure of dependence. And that's kind of the power and the insight of copulas that you would like to utilize as well for your data sets and that you could like, uh, would like to use for the um, spatial cases. And there are many more funny things to do with copulas. So this one is a nice copula, it's a student T copula. So kind of, if you get a scatter plot like the left-hand side here, you kind of, well, it's probably not really correlated if you just calculate a correlation measure. But of course, there's a strong structure in the data set. And this structure can be described using copulas. So it's kind of um, revisiting your scatter plots wherever you said, well, this doesn't work out for regression or whatever I would like to model. Think of copulas where you kind of might find a suitable copula family that can describe it. Yeah, yeah. And um, this is based on a nice and simple looking theorem. There's this kind of single line equation here, which tells us that any multivariate distribution can be decomposed in the marginal distributions and a copula. And this works both directions. So you can kind of build multivariate distribution with your favorite marginal distributions. You can mix exponential, normal, uh, whatever you like. 
You can take those module distributions that describe your process, fit a useful copula to it, and you get a new multivariate distribution that can describe your process. And then you can have this full multivariate distribution and can do simulation from it. You can estimate mean values. You can whatever you like. It's really kind of a full tool to define new multivariate distribution. It's kind of very flexible and uh, can help you a lot. Um, the downside is always larger flexibility means you need more data. So kind of this is not a technique to apply for the first 30 or 40 points. If it's in two dimension and you have 100 point pairs, then it's then you could start to do it, but typically you would like to have even more points. And let's see if we can do it. Yeah. And kind of in a longer list of copulas that you will find in R as well is implemented in this uh, small shiny app here. So you can kind of look at different types of copulas. And here we have nicely asymmetric copulas where kind of you get those shapes of dependencies. And we can kind of set it to contours. We kind of get different shapes of contours. And uh, this kind of the star-like shape that I showed you in the scatter plot earlier. So this uh, 3D wireframe surface is kind of it's the density of the copula. Um, and density can be read as likelihood to see points here or kind of strengths of dependence. So here where the kind of you have this high value, so a very strong dependency, those those points in the middle part occur together. And kind of if you move to the one or the other side, you kind of get values on this diagonal axis that you can see here from the contour plot as well. And that's exactly what we've seen uh, here in this plot that you kind of if you sample from it, so those are all samples here that you get kind of many, many points along those axes and just very, very few that kind of extend out here. I think these are 500 sample points. And based on the margins you put to it, you might kind of get completely skewed, or not, you know, well, yeah, again, skewed um, patterns here and, and different versions of it. And it's really that the um, copula is kind of independent of the marginal distribution. So you can put your copula any kind of marginal distribution and you get something uh, new and you kind of can do it reverse. If you take out the marginal distributions based on the cumulative distribution function, then you kind of get back to the copula and can describe the dependence. Okay, so far, questions? <laughs> Yes, please. What does this uh, graph OK, the question, um, again, to, to explain what the graph really means is, um, let's think of, um, uh, we make a survey, taking weight and body lengths of kind of everybody sitting here, everybody taking part in Geostat summer school. Um, then you would have two variables, weight and body length, that you could plot in a scatter plot. And you get a nicely cloud, probably not one like this, but you kind of um, get a cloud like this. Or oh, let's go here. This is kind of combinations of body weights and body length. And then typically you would like to understand how does the body length influence weight and the other way around. So how are these two variables connected to each other? And kind of first step is typically to do to fit a regression curve, regression line to it, and just say, well, this is the average behavior. There are some deviations that are somewhat normally distributed around it. But kind of a more sophisticated approach is really to look at this, the actual scatter of points, not just to summarize the points to a single line, but really to look at the scatter of points, and then really to kind of get to a distribution that can describe how those points are scattered. So it's a more detailed way to describe dependence between different variables. And in the spatial case, it's pretty much the same. We're always looking at pairs of locations. So we have two variables. So we have the distribution at location S1 and the distribution at location S2. 
and would like to know how are these two dependent on each other. So to describe the dependence differently than by a covariance matrix or covariance value, we can replace this by a copula and really try to describe how the scatter of points between those two locations looks like. So what kind of distribution analysis process. It's really, Quijing does the same, but Quijing always assumes that the copula you're using is a Gaussian copula. So it really is, the ideas are more or less the same, but uh, it's just tied to a single possible family. But there are many, many more families out there. Um, those implemented in this copula take I just showed you on the web uh, are just those that are available on R, but of course you can think of any kind of spread that you might come across. And um, kind of any, well, this copula has to fulfill certain conditions, but kind of the condition is that it is uh, a distribution function on the unit square. So any distribution function on the unit square can be a copula. So anything that, any density that integrates to one on the unit square can be understood as a copula and then used for modeling. So you have all kinds of degrees of freedoms to kind of have corner cases to uh, shape them. Kind of nice corner cases uh, here in the Clayton family. You kind of, you really get a boundary and you won't see any points, yeah, come on. you won't see any points beyond this boundary, but you will have a certain spread over here. This may be. So you have kind of slightly curved boundary here. And once this parameter gets more to minus one, and this boundary becomes sharper and becomes stronger. Uh, there are tests, there are kind of fitting routines, you can fit them based on maximum likelihood. Uh, there are goodness of fit tests. Um, but this is just kind of for the non-spatial case, it's all pretty well developed, but for the spatial case, it's just kind of really active research to, to bring this forward and kind of to get some insights how this would really nicely work in the spatial case. I will show you a few cases, what it can do. And um, yeah, then we can kind of, this is, the. This part will be a bit shorter, but then we kind of can start with the hands-on a bit earlier. Maybe this solves the, the question from the end from the last session. Ah, okay. Um, no, it's not um, the distance between values. So kind of if you look at this, x-axis, it's really the values you observe at one point, or kind of, <laughs> at, at one point, yeah, kind of. What, what you assume, you assume there's some random distribution underlying, and this random distribution follows a certain pattern. This is easier to, to see if you say, these points are all the kind of question students for the body weight and body length, then the x-axis might be body length, and the y-axis might be body weight. So really, the, the process you observe that you would like to understand. <coughs> and this zero to one is kind of the cumulative distribution of this marginal. So kind of you're counting up the cases of students that are smaller than uh, one meter and 80 and kind of having this as a ratio of the full number of students. So really the cumulative distribution function as you know from, from one dimension of probability integrals. And it's really kind of, on this first plot, it's um, kind of when distance comes into it, we would assume that there's, that this spread of points changes with distance. So for points very close to each other, we would assume that these points are very close on, on the main diagonal, so they are strongly dependent. And when we move further apart from, and the two points move further apart from each other, then you would assume that the points kind of spread into the full surface to some point where it's completely independent, where you will find points all over. So kind of the distance here is kind of the tuning parameter, just as for the variogram, where you put in the distance, and you get different variogram values, different strengths of variability, 
um, for different distances. You get kind of different spread of points for different distances. And kind of, you would look at all point pairs from a certain distance from a certain leg class. So you take all points that are, between, that are between 0 and 20, meter, 20 kilometers apart from each other, take those two point values and plot them in the scatter plot. And then this is what you get as kind of this copular scatter plot. And you do this for every bin, and then you would like to understand how does the spread change with distance if you're moving from the first bin to the second to the third. So we'd like to have some changing dependent structure over space. A different number and a different uh, spread. So they're closer to the diagonal, they're further apart, they might be skewed, they might have a boundary. And that's what you can mimic if you really change the copula family with distance. And if you kind of tie it to a Gaussian distribution, then you will always have the same shape. They might, it, it gets wider and, and narrow, but it's always the same elliptical shape. And uh, with different families, like here, you kind of they more spread in the lower corner than they are in the upper corner. So there's some some asymmetry in the plot, which you can see as well. It's a bit harder here, but they're kind of more spread here, and they're very condensed in the top right corner. And this really relates to the dependent structure that you see on the left hand side. So the x-axis could be the value observed at location S1 and the y-axis value observed at location S2 for all pairs that you have in a certain distance class. So you take the first observation combined with the next close and kind of get this scatter of points. And then the y would be the same but for time? Um, well, the first is to do it for space, but then you can do it for time as well. So we do binning not only for space, spatial distances, but for spatial temporal distances. And then, like in the surface earlier, where we had kind of every combination of spatial and temporal distance, a single uh, gamma value from the virogram, you get one of these scatter plots. And then you would like to understand how these scatter plots change over space and over time. It's really the idea that you can Instead of using a single value that describes the dependence, you can use a full distribution describing the dependence. Uh, yeah, this last theorem is kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, this is written out for two dimension, but it's true for any dimension. So this really works for any dimension. Whatever data set you have, you look at, you can kind of stick together all the margins in a copula and you get a multivariate distribution. So why is this useful? Um, you really get a clear kind of procedure, fit margins, fit copula, done. So it's kind of, it looks like an easy two-step procedure, but of course, there are many decisions to be made, which kind of marginal distribution would I like to fit, which one fits best, which kind of copular family do I use, but kind of the building blocks are really precise and they are independent of each other. So you can fit a marginal distribution, fit a copula, change the marginal distribution that wouldn't change the copula and kind of optimize those two steps independently of each other. Um, as already stressed, you get a huge flexibility and um, well, for a few more copulas, you can look at my copula take on the website to get an idea what might be there. What we want to do, because it's spatial statistics, we want to account for distance. So we assume distance has a strong influence, not only on dependent strengths, but on the shape, on the scatter of the plot, uh, of the points. Um, we assume the dependent structure it's kind of the same for all neighbors. So it doesn't matter if I looking, take a central point and look at the location next north, next south, it, it doesn't matter. It only matters how far it is apart. That's kind of the isotropy assumption earlier from the quidging slides. Uh, and we assume again stationarity, so that it doesn't matter if I'm in which part of my study region I am, I just can take 
the binning just as we bin the data for the virogram over space and over time. And based on this binning, uh, I can start to estimate copulas for it. And as I said, I would like to have families changing with distance. So I might have a different copula family with a different typical spread for short distances than for larger distances. Um, so this kind of spatial bivariate copula that's parameterized by distance h here is just a convex combination. Mm -hmm. So I take like 30% of the one copula plus 70% 70, 70 of the second copula, and this ratio changes with distance. So it's kind of a moving average of copulas based on the distance. So just kind of more technical background how to really achieve this change in copulas. Um, this has been bivariate, and there's a nice tool as well to kind of combine bivariate copulas to something larger. So as I said earlier, if you're thinking in hydrology, and you have these three dimensions, discharge, volume, duration, uh, that you would like to model, you can model them pairwise, and then kind of stick them together with this Wine copula technique to build a three-dimensional copula out of it. There are higher dimensional families of copulas, of course, but they might lack flexibility to what you would like to do. So these wine copulas allow you to build everything up out of bivariate building blocks. So for every pair of combination, you can choose your new copula family, new parameter, and kind of can build up higher dimensional structures that can describe your higher dimensional distributions. That's what we adopt for the spatial case as well. So we take the central location S0 and the four nearest neighbors, S1 to S4, and kind of every edge here um, indicates a copula that describes dependence between these two locations. So what is the dependence between uh, the process at S0 with S1, the process the dependence between S1, S2, uh, S0, S2, S0, S3, S0, S4. And the next step, we can do some kind of conditioning based on the copulas we used earlier and then look at the dependence between locations one and two, given I know what happened at location zero. And again, between location one and three, given I've seen what happened in zero, one and four, given zero, and this kind of continues. And this tree can be kind of grow further. So instead of four closest neighbors, you could have 10 closest neighbors, and then you would have more trees until you end up with a single edge that you can model with a single bivariate copula, and then you're done. Uh, computational power gets an issue. That's why I like to stick to five or ten neighbors. Uh, in the financial world, where everything looks a bit more smooth and it's a bit easier to, to handle, um, they are using this wine copulas with about a hundred dimensions. So we really get a huge tree out of bivariate copulas and uh, can really describe hundred dimensional distributions when they look at hundred different companies that are in a single DAX index where they would like to kind of understand how do they depend on each other, what happens if a certain company goes bankrupt, what happens to the other ones. Um, yeah, the upper trees are just kind of built out of the lower building blocks. This just kind of checks what I just said. Uh, this looks a bit complicated, but kind of in simple words, it's just a product of all copulas that you have been fitting. So you simply multiply up all copulas from all the trees, and this is a simple design how you get the density of the full copula distribution. So it's no big inversion, no integral, it's simply the product of all copulas that you have been using. And this looks even a bit more complicated, but it's actually just a, kind of a conditional distribution of the copulas you have anyway, so this kind of Looks complicated, but you get it almost for free if you fit it to copula first. For the interpolation, it's the same idea as for the Gaussian case, where I, um, for the prediction of a single pixel of a single point based on observations, I kind of build this conditional distribution. How is the random process distributed at this point? I'd like to estimate given all the data I've seen. And the same is what happens here. We take our single location that we would like to predict, use the four closest neighbors that have been observed, um, condition our copula based on the observed data. So we say the four nearest neighbors have these four values. And what we get is then a single conditional distribution. And kind of the mean value is just the integral of this distribution. 
kind of what makes this more complicated in computational terms is that you really have to numerically integrate this density. In the Gaussian world, it's simply a product of matrices. That's why it's so fast to do preaching, but takes more time to really to do the integration. That's kind of why the Gaussian distribution is so, so widely used, because it's so easily uh, calculated to get conditional distributions, to get estimates out of it. But instead of calculating the expected value, you can calculate any percentile, so you can estimate the median, you can estimate confidence intervals right away. So just kind of looking for the 95 percentile and the 5 percentile. And um, you can get rather fast, precise confidence estimates. Um, it's all kind of captured in an R package that's on R Forge because it's kind of still under rapid development and kind of uses other packages, Wine Copula, to do this kind of combination, uh, com combination steps, space time to do the space time handling, and Copula to get some Copula uh, functions. As, a, as an um, example, um, there's kind of has been a spatial interpolation comparison in 2004. Um, on a kind of nuclear radiation, we kind of got a data set with 200 measurements, where of kind of 198 are all kind of background radiation at a very low level, and two have been simulated to have an accident. And now the question is, how does the kind of surface of radiation look like if you have those two outliers? Of course, you could do quidging to get kind of the surface of it, but uh, the surfaces will look very much different depending on the technique and depending on the dependent structure that you use. Uh, first step is here as so a two-step, kind of looking at the simple inverse distance weighted interpolation. It seems like there is some, some background pattern that I try to estimate the trend surface. So instead of looking at the raw observations, I use residuals after I subtracted the trend surface from the data set. And that's just kind of a pre-processing step to get closer to stationarity. Um, the Marshall distribution, these are the 200 points that you get to tune your data set and to estimate the cross-validation uh, locations. Kind of between well, 0 and, and 200 here. And there are two locations very, very far up the tail of the distribution, above 1,000. And you would like to really have a, one model that describes the distribution of these points over space. So what you see in the top figure is really you know, how the dependent structure changes with distance. For the main, the title has a distance that kind of runs up from 0 to 80 kilometers, I think, 60. And you see how the dependent structure changes. And this is now fitted to empirical data. So it's really, it, it's not something uh, crazy thought of that could be nice to model. It's, it's really, it's data and it's fitted to the data. And this is what the data told us how this dependent structure changes with distance. So the symmetric in the beginning is something close to Gaussian distribution, but then you get something asymmetric with a spike in the front and then a spike in the back and then flattens out to uh, independence. So independence is simply surface at, at one. So it's just kind of plain surface. That's kind of uh, where it ends. And these are just kind of three different distinct steps, just in case the animation wouldn't run. Um, for 10 kilometers, 25, and 50 kilometers, how it looks like. And here you see as well, you have two spikes here. This is actually um, a student T distribution, the same that could do this, this cross-like shapes. And these are kind of two other, it's, uh, yeah, two other copulas at two other time points. It's kind of very different, kind of the contours have very different structure. And this is what we would like to capture, how this structure of dependence changes with distance. Uh, this graph is a bit ugly to read, but it's kind of, we have different spatial trees, as I showed in this wine approach, where we have kind of this uh, first tree, second tree, and this kind of gets each time one not less, one location less. And here you see you know, the first 
black line, the top one, is kind of the first level how the correlation behaves. And this, kind of, this, this plot is somewhat similar to a virogram. So really see how the strength of dependence, the correlation, here it's measured in Kendall's tau, decreases with distance. So that's what we would assume. Points close to each other have a stronger dependence than points dis further apart. So this is simply the strength of dependence, so a single value. And what you see as letters plotted on top here is the name of the family of the copula. So you see changes between families uh, based on the distance. So we change from student T to a um, cubic quadratic section copula on to a Clayton one and back to cubic quadratic sections. And this change of families is as well different for different spatial trees. And kind of you get what you would hope for to assume that once you have kind of this conditional distribution uh, that I model the dependence between location one and two given what's happening at zero, that kind of the spatial dependency decreases with every step. So that you manage to capture the spatial dependence step by step and you don't uh, kind of, the dependence reduces because you model part of it. You can't model everything in the first tree. That's why you still have spatial dependence in the upper trees and the higher trees. But with every step, you get a little bit less spatial correlation, so kind of explaining more and more of the process. And this is kind of the final result, an interpolated grid, like well, what we've seen so often. Um, but what you see here is kind of a very steep, spiky interpolation. And this is around the area where the two observations are uh, naturally. And kind of, if you would kind of imagine this done by creaging, uh, you would get a much larger footprint of this extreme because creaging tends to smooth anything, everything to to wider space, and it would kind of probably last up to value of 600, and these spikes go up to 1,200 and a bit above. So you really are able to capture those spikes in the data set and are able to describe the dependence of background radiation and extremes with the same model. Yeah, please. Um, well, they are, more they are more flexible and you need more data, but kind of um, the fitting idea is very similar to the one of Quijing, like having uh, this, these functions are very close to variograms, so you can even translate them one to one if you have kind of a, a certain mapping. Um, so you follow the same steps, but you allow for more flexibility because you not only say, I just want to know what the covariance is, assuming Gaussian model, I want to know what is the covariance, allowing for different models. They are data motivated because data shows such patterns that cannot be explained with Gaussian dependent structures, but I wouldn't say they are more data driven than the Gaussian approach. Um, so, based on this interpolation comparison, you get this 200 points that you could have as data points, and you would like to predict uh, a bit more than 800 out of it, and those 800 have been held back for cross validation. So, the uh, kind of author of the data set had the full data set and then would compare your approach against it. I, I didn't uh, take part at that time, it was way too early. Um, but kind of, I reused the data set to kind of try to figure out how good the spatial wine copula is in comparison to other approaches. And it uh, turns out to perform rather well, in, especially in terms of mean absolute error, where it even kind of beats the best one from this interpolation comparison. But of course, if you look at the other uh, cross validation statistics, uh, there's still improvement possible and necessary to really kind of compete completely here. Um, but what is nice that you, this is now trained for this extreme data set, but you've, you kind of provide just a simple data set. Um, it's as well capable of capturing even pure Gaussian depends if it is Gaussian. So it's not, it doesn't exclude the Gaussian case, it just kind of uh, extends it widely. So uh, this comparison had as well a second slot where you not only compared the extreme value data set, but the 
kind of normal standard situation background data set, and the technique needs to be capable of kind of deciding what to do. So it really kind of based on the data, uh, you would get different models in the spatial wine coupler approach, and kind of in both cases it would score rather well in the overall ranking. But what's kind of more important than the pure cross-validation statistics is kind of the uh, reproduction of the marginal distributions. So the emergency scenario out of this a bit more than 1,000 points, if you look at all those points, um, has this distribution. So we have the background radiation down here and the extreme emergency cases up here around 1,000. And of course, if you want to do the prediction, you would like to rebuild this marginal distribution. And the wine copy approaches here are able to get in the same range. There are fewer points, of course, so they don't get all of them, but at least they produce points in the same range, and they have this gap actually in between, between background radiation and extremes up here. If we only look at spatial, uh, as a Gaussian example, so I, I simply said everything in the wine is Gaussian, um, you don't get those extremes. You still kind of, you can pretty well estimate the background, but you don't get the extremes. And there are kind of a few more techniques compared here for different marginal distributions. And if you do, for instance, lock reaching, you kind of completely uh, miss the background radiation even. And kind of you get extreme values, but at most up to 500, and you don't get the very top and residual reaching, don't get any uh, extremes either. And what's another very nice feature of it, um, as we've seen earlier, the kind of quidging variance and the quidging uncertainty is completely driven by location. And those red dotted lines here are the quidging predictor at a certain location. So the top one is an emergency site and the bottom one is a uh, standard background site. And these quidging conditional distributions they are always Gaussian distributions by definition. Uh, so they're kind of parameterized by the mean value, that's your estimate, and the quidging variance. And as they're Gaussian, they're always symmetric, and you get things like negative confidence intervals here. So if you would like the, at the five percentile, you get something negative here. And it's even more apparent if you look at the background radiation value. Here, the kind of confidence interval of the uh, quidging approach is much wider then of the copular approach, if you again look at the 5%, you're from minus 100, and 95 is by plus 300. And for the quidging, it's very, very narrow, just around, uh, say, 90 and 120. So for the spatial wine, the kind of uncertainty intervals depend, of course, on the location and the denseness of the measurement network, but as well on the value you're predicting. So if you're predicting a very huge value, you're rather uncertain about it because there's a huge variability. But if you're predicting somewhere in the background area, in the background region, you have many small values around it, you predict a small value, then you're very certain about, the okay, there is only a small value. But if you're on an extreme side, you can't be completely sure that it is extreme, but you kind of include it. And you always get values that do make sense. So the confidence interval can only be in the range of the range of the margins that you modeled. So you don't get negative values if you're looking at concentrations. That's something uh, rather helpful. And you can simulate from it. Uh, here, of course, you see more spikes than in the original data set. But kind of if you redo the simulation, uh, you will always see spikes around this area where there really has been the emergency case and just some appearing all around. Um, but this is because the model just have, has to allow for a certain incident and it kind of has a certain probability to occur a certain incident, and this kind of happens all around the space, but it's kind of really triggered constantly here around the area uh, where you observe the high value. So it's kind of a conditional simulation. Benefits, the richer flexibility. Uh, you can allow for asymmetric dependence structures. That's especially interesting for time. Um, as I said earlier, that kind of Today's value 
uh, influences tomorrow but can't influence yesterday. You can describe those asymmetric dependencies with copulas, so it helps in temporal modeling. Mm, and you get this probabilistic advantage of having flexible confidence intervals, flexible conditional distributions, and that you're not tied to the Gaussian distribution anymore. And there's, of course, always space for further extensions, uh, including covariates like altitude and population, uh, more flexible neighborhoods. This has been already done, I think. Uh, larger neighborhoods. You, can, you don't have to run up this tree completely. So if you have 100 dimensions, you don't up, run up 100 trees. You can cut the tree at a certain point and do something different with the remaining ones. But improvement of performance is one of the key issues. The reference seems to be broken, but there's at least one. Um, that's about copulas in spatial statistics. So the extension to time has been done and uh, is as well in the SP copula package. Um, really following the idea that we kind of build leg classes over space and time and then kind of have this convex combination of copulas that change with distance once uh, for distance and over time. So kind of a convex combination of convex combinations of copulas that kind of adapt to all kinds of locations within your spatial temporal grid of distance classes we have been looking at. Questions? Yeah, please. Uh, sorry again, please. It's a set of usual creeding, or ah, ah. Uh, yeah, kind of. You can solve the same questions, interpolate data set to continuous surface, but with a completely la with a very large set of tools of possible constellations. So it's a better technique. Uh, it's a more flexible technique, but if you think in terms of better as well in computation time, afford to fit your model. It takes more time to kind of fit your model, to run it. So if you're kind of in need of an um, kind of in-time, real-time processing, uh, then this is nice, but it's not doable currently. So then you kind of tie it to cridging and just use something simple. It really depends on the uh, application you have. If it's worth trying, and of course, well, it, it does capture as well Gaussian dependencies. So if th something is Gaussian, it will detect Gaussian dependencies. Uh, but then it's not worse to do it, of course. So then you could better just stick to creaking and do it directly way faster. Okay. Then I would say it's um, time for hands on. Thank you. Um, I have to do a little bit organize myself, but so um, shall we directly look into the spatial temporal case, or would you find it more helpful to start spatial first? Spatial first. Spatial first. Good. <laughs> step by step. Step by step. Good. No, that's that's uh, fine. Let me see. We have a useful example. G-stat. G G-stat. Okay. For now, G-stat. Um, Product better lattice fields. So, of course, G-stat implies SP, and uh, I typically lose lattice to treat some, some plotting facilities. Um, I assume you're all familiar with R Studio. <laughs> I could try to make them available. Would they help? It would, wouldn't it? Let me see. Uh, 
I'll put them on the, the course website as well. But for the moment, it might be easier to get them from Bitbucket. So it's bitbucket.org slash ben underscore grela slash igwse. And we will only at first look into fields underscore clean. The unclean files have some plotting candy more in it to produce PDFs to be included in a, in a different talk. Uh, fields underscore clean. Yeah. If you don't have the complete folder, you can kind of use the R project file, but for now it's well enough to use fields underscore clean. Uh, I would suggest Git to just kind of clone it locally, but uh, I don't know if there's an easy way to get it from Bitbucket. So this is kind of all based on, on Git technology, where you can kind of have a version management and kind of push, push data and kind of go back to version a few weeks ago. Um, so if you're familiar with Git, it might be easier for you to kind of clone it locally to your local drive and then work on it. Um, who needs some more time, or shall we start? Start, okay. Um, so it's SP, GSTART, and Letters that I would suggest for now. And um, I don't know if you, something might be repeated from, from earlier sessions, but it's really helpful to kind of, to get to used to it. Uh, this is data function that kind of gives you all the available data from a certain package. So we get a kind of a new, I can close these to make it. So we get a list of data sets. And if you provide this argument package, you will only get the data sets from a certain package. So this is to check what kind of data sets are there in a certain package. And uh, typically it's, it's a good point to start to redo some examples from the from the uh, package to understand how it works, what to do, how it looks like. And we use the same one, the, the most data set, as I used on the slides. And this is kind of very widely distributed, widely used in the R GSTAT community, in the spatial R community. So we simply say data MERS, and we get this data frame called MERS in the uh, in the environment, and kind of if we extend it here, we kind of see there are 14 variables in it uh, with 155 observations of different kind uh, elevation, link, z, copper, distance, flooding frequency, soil types, so many, many 
things to look at. But now it's still a data frame. So if you say str for structure, merge, then you kind of get the structure that has been shown here as well. And it says it's a data frame. But once we say coordinates, and we kind of tell R which columns in the data frame are the coordinates, uh, it changes its, its type, it changes its uh, object type. And we get a longer list of uh, possible slots, so we have a data slot, coordinates, bounding box, project for string, which is empty in this case because we didn't define it really. And uh, yeah. now it's kind of spatial data that we can work with. We need the grid as well because we like to predict on this grid along the Moise River. Uh, Here we are. And we have to set the coordinates for the grid and say, well, this is a grid. So gridded of Moist grid is true. And now it's spatial pixels. At the first plot, the minimum requirement for plotting is only object variable. Then you get something like this. And if you would like to tweak it, to your needs, place a color, place different colors, have a different uh, key at a different place, and you pass some more arguments like uh, cuts, where the key should go, key space, scaling of the points, and you get the plot like this. The most simple case to interpolate is just by inverse distance weighted. So there's a function IDV for inverse distance weighted. Simple points further away get less weight in the um, weighted average and weight simply one over distance. So you can do this. This goes in seconds, fraction of a second, and have a first plot how this kind of field might look like. But this now, this doesn't assume any randomness, doesn't assume any distribution. It's really simply a deterministic uh, method to kind of get a very first idea how it might look like. Just in the, as in the Joker examples, where the uh, inverse distance rated interpolation suggested that there is some trend surface underlying. <clears throat> so it's just kind of very first step to take to get an impression of what you're trying to do here. So let's move into real geostatistics and estimate the empirical virogram. So there's this helpful function virogram. And uh, if you press F1, you will get some additional help, how it looks like, what it does, and of possible arguments. And most helpful, I'd say, the examples in the bottom. And we simply say, well, we would like to have zinc as variable, moise as data set. And the variogram is calculated. And to see what has happened, we look at the plot of it. If we here do as well str of the fitted variogram, then we see that it's much more than just a few points. So we have number of points, we have distance, we have the gamma value, so the virogram value. Uh, there are a few columns if you have directional virograms. So if you don't, if you don't assume an isotropic field, you might assume that you have directional influences, and then you can kind of look into fit different virograms to different directions. Uh, idea just to kind of find back your values, attributes, about boundaries what you have been calculating. And to get to know all the different virograms, virogram models, because now we have the empirical virogram and would like to go over to the theoretical one, you just call VGM with empty arguments and then you get the list of the 20 implemented virograms that are implemented in GSTAT. Um, 
So the most popular ones are really nugget, exponential, spherical, matern class, I'd say. And here we can fit different models simply. So we provide different starting values, which are essentially only changing in the type of model. So it's spherical, exponential, and linear that you look at here. Uh, no, you can only compare these models by um, the difference between, uh, it's again the root mean squared error between model line and observed values. That's the only way to compare between these models. Or didn't? How could we do that? How could we? Ah, yeah, sure. Um, well, you kind of run those three lines, and then you kind of have an attribute. So to find those attributes, you can as well look at structure, and there we see um, we have a certain model selected, we have a partial cell, we have a range, kappa values, this is for the Martian class, um, different angles on isotropy, kind of further arguments, and we have this um, SS error term below, and this is kind of um, the difference between points and the fitted line. Uh, in this case, kind of, um, it's easier to read if you use kind of, if you simple a VGM linear. So if you just kind of call the object, it has a nicer print function that kind of shows uh, what's really in there, not the data structure. So we fitted linear model, we provided a linear model here. And we have again the partial sill of the nugget effect and the partial sill of the linear effect. So the nugget is about 30,000. This is large because uh, the values of the zinc concentrations are large. And if you have the square differences, then it kind of grows up. That's why there are so large numbers here. So the nugget is 30,000 and uh, kind of the a partial sill of the model, so kind of the contribution of the spatial model you're using is like 127,000 at a range of 608 meters. So we can, to, to visualize, it's plot the uh, empirical one, this is VGM MOIS, <coughs> and then we add the model we would like to look at, VGM line. <coughs> we get this line here. So a range of this 608 meters and the nugget here of this 30,000 and, no, and the, kind of the partial sill of the linear model is just the difference between the nugget and the maximum here. And the sum of the partial sills is the joint sill or the sill of the variable model, which is again kind of the overall variance of your data set. So, so the sum of, of the seal attributed to nugget and linear would be the whole variance in the model. Yeah. And, but then, I'm sorry, I didn't get, so nugget in this case would be representing what? With respect, which would be the difference between nugget and linear? Yeah. Uh, nugget is kind of, <coughs> The variability that is in your data set, even if you know about the spatial dependence, is kind of some noise on top of your data set that you can't explain by distance. So we would like to explain the full variability in the data set, but we always will have a small amount of noise due to measurement issues, lack of measurements, some non-understanding, some non-spatial process that is part of the process uh, that we can't describe. And this is amounted to the nugget effect and the partial sill of the really of the model, of the linear model, that's the amount of variability that we can explain by distance and by the neighbors.
Uh, yeah, it's it's linear. It's simple kind of a scaling from distance in meters to variogram values. Um, but it's not necessarily a linear autoregressive model. So it's kind of... Not a correlation. Yeah. It, well, it is the correlation between those points, but it's not kind of, not in the sense of car or SAR models, if you... No? Okay. Um, I thought you were kind of referring to conditional autoregressive model or a simultaneous autoregressive model, regression model. So. I'm just trying to, to, make, to make sense of, of what, which is exactly the information that I will get uh, from, the, from the variance contained within this linear model which depends on, on this value. Yeah. It, it gives you a, a value how strongly those points in space are correlated to each other. How strongly do they depend on each other? And kind of the way how the strength changes is in this case linear. That's why it's a linear model. And if we would kind of plot a different model, So the spherical, we get different values, and we can plot it as well. So if we have a slightly smaller sill, it's now 25,000, and a larger uh, partial sill for the spatial effect, almost 135,000, and a larger range. So here it's not linear anymore, so we have a kind of a curve that kind of describes how the strength of dependence changes with distance. No, it, it will affect both. It, it does affect the parameter estimation itself, and it affects the prediction of the value. Because kind of if you change the dependent structure, uh, kind of the influence of the neighbors will change. <coughs> so if you're always looking at the same four neighbors, the difference isn't so big. But if you kind of uh, have a huge data set and kind of the range extends, for instance, so everything beyond the range is just not considered. But if you just kind of if the range suddenly doubles because he's using a different model, then you kind of have a double amount of points, and these kind of may uh, further smooth the, your random fields. But yeah, I, I will say that this will happen locally within the field, mm -hmm. different places of the field. But for the for the walk for the walk field, uh, you mean if the, if the mean value of the full field would change? Ah, good point. Uh, well, we assume that the Gaussian random field has, f if it's stationary, we assume it has a single mean value. And to kind of, if you would simulate from it just independently, you would just kind of simulate a hundred times from one dimensional uniform, uh, not uniform, one dimensional univariate normal distributions. They're really completely uncorrelated. Um, but the mean value 
after several runs of simulation should be the same. Yeah, because you assume the overall mean of the field is the same. When you start to conditionally simulate, based on your observations, you will get different results. Because then you condition on the observations you have, and they might change how the field changes. Um, yeah, of course you can try out on your own further models. So if you would like to fit a Martian class for two or three kappa values. Uh, so let's take. So what do you mean by stepwise? Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because kind of it's assumed that this line breaks at the range. So if you go back to the plot here, so this is a range, and kind of if we have one line, there's no kind of um, it could go to infinity. So you d you have to define a point where the correlation drops. Otherwise, your line would be kind of yeah flat necessarily. Because if you kind of go up to infinity, your line will always be flat. So you really have to kind of find a point where you assume that the correlation drops over space, where points are uncorrelated afterwards, and that's kind of this break point here. Um, Matern, so we put in Matern here, and look for additional parameters, and below here is Kappa, and let's see, three. And then we can, of course, plot it as well, see how it looks like. So you can do things like this. So this is a bit more flexible, the Martian class. And this might even be, well, have the smallest error here. So to compare the error, we're looking for a certain attribute of the uh, fitted variogram, and this attribute is called SSERR, sum of squared errors. And the linear model is a very large number. <laughs> but the uh, Matan even has a larger one. Down, exponential and spherical. So the exponential seems to have the smallest error here. So this seems to be the best model how we can do right now. We have thin zeros plots. And once we kind of decided on a model, um, we can then kind of start to do the quidging. What you could do as well is if you s have an empirical diagram, the very long kind of constant tail, uh, it's sometimes helpful to set a cutoff. So if you kind of, for the uh, diagram estimation, up somewhere line 25 something, uh, you can set an <coughs> cut off. Ah, here it is. And say 1,000 meters. And then kind of you get different bins because by default, GSET always tries to make 15 bins on the range of your data. And if you say a cut off of 1,000, it kind of breaks out 1,000 into 15 equally spaced points. And then you have to kind of check about the number of points, but there are still plenty of points in it. The, the first cell with 16 points, of course, a bit uh, too few, but then you kind of go up to almost 100, up to 300 points, 
So there are enough points per bin to have a sensible estimate out of it. So it's okay to tell it to 1,000. Uh, if you say a cutoff to 100, you kind of does something as well, and you get as well points, but of course they don't tell you anything anymore. It's just kind of random effect of very few points, and if you look at the number of points per grid, you kind of, uh, per bin, per leg class, you see one, two, three points in these leg classes, so it's just kind of a single value, but you have to rely on kind of averages of these points to get any sensible idea out of it. So 100 is not a good idea. 1,000 works well. Even though this looks a bit surprising here with this kind of step. And then, of course, all these will look slightly different. So the linear fit now is a single line, but kind of, of course, has a break somewhere out of the plotting area. And the spherical one looks pretty nice. Exponential is a bit hard to tell how, how it goes on. So maybe our range is a bit too short. Now our cutoff. But Montaigne looks a bit nicer. But now the um, errors might have changed. In this case, the Matern class has the smallest error because it now isn't anymore compared to values beyond 1,000, where it didn't fit so well earlier. So changing the cutoff might as well change the fits, of course, but as well change the sum of squared errors, because you might have fewer points, different points. And you, if you say it's more or less constant, but there's still quite a lot of variability, this kind of messes up your uh, sum of squared errors because kind of you compare to all those points as well. <laughs> yeah, please. Is it possible to have uh, a combined plot of the various variables all stuck on the top of each other? Um, Should. Good point. So uh, in the spatial temporal case, you kind of get these wireframes next to the other level plots. But um, that's a question for Edsa, if he has implemented it somewhere. I, I don't know. I uh, kind of tweaked it for the, um, for the slides. I had several lines in the same plot, but this was more or less by overlying them. So kind of just stick them all on top of each other, uh, but they're, I guess there is, but I'm, I'm right now not aware of it, how, how it works. Kind of as first proxy one could Ah, yeah, it's lettuce, so it doesn't work. Um, you do it differently with lettuce. Kind of store each lettuce plot in its own object and then place them one after another using print in different locations. So for now, we only can kind of click on the buttons back and forth in the plot history to see what's nicer. So then Quijing is just this one line here, where we say it's still the zinc that we're interested in, it's a moist data set, it's a moist grid we would like to predict. And we have the spherical model, but we would like to use the Matan model. And then we can predict a map. So this is for the Matan. Let's see which one was the worst fit. Lin. <laughs> Sh 
хорошо. For some reason, this linear fit is uh, so bad that it even predicts negative values. So we kind of get values up to minus 500 of concentration in zinc in this location. So there seems to be something going really wrong. But if you use the better fitting Matern class model, you kind of get a nice predicted map out of it. And if you look at the structure of the moist grid, it's called again a spatial pixels data frame now here, spatial pixels. Uh, we have a data slot and this data slot has two variables. This is variable one dot predicted and variable one dot variance. So these are the two uh, things we could plot. So instead of the prediction, we could plot as well the uh, predicted variance, which is basically the same map as in the, um, as in the slides earlier. Do we have a lunch break now? Okay. Um, then I suggest we continue with space time after the lunch break and uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>